Uh, yeah, so I was considering what kind of talk I wanted to give at with this kind of audience, a lot of trade unionists, and I figured that perhaps the best kind of talk would be to talk practically about what Union has been doing for the past few years, like how we went from uh, being scared about robots taking half our jobs to actually starting to do some practical things uh, in related issues. So yeah, I've been working at Unionen for uh, four and a half years. Uh, past few months, I, my job kind of changed. I'm a PhD student now, so I'm doing my PhD thesis inside of Unionen. One of the topics I'm covering is the platform economy and, like Jenny said, the, the, the diffusing boundaries of the firm, I'd say. Uh, that is one of my topics I'm gonna be handling. Uh, I started working on this topic like a few months after I started. Uh, and this started with the whole Digital when the whole digitalization debate started to gain ground, which I usually attribute to uh, Eric Bernielson and Andrew McAfee's book, The Second Machine Age, which talked about the fact that it seems that digital progress is speeding up and we are now able to solve some amazing problems a few decades ahead of when it was predicted. So self-driving cars, artificial intelligence, more, uh, yeah, this kind of stuff. I'm not going to go into detail about that. You've probably heard it already. Uh, so, and uh, about this time, uh, a paper that has already been quoted came out as well, which was uh, Carl Frey and Michael Osborne's paper about, oh, I can't remember the title of it now, but that's the one that said that half the jobs are going to disappear. And that was super interesting, I thought. Uh, and uh, they had, you know, estimates on number of U.S. jobs. They had occupational codes for U.S. jobs. So I'm like, I'm going to translate this into Swedish, and I was done. But one week before we were going to launch it, someone else came out with numbers, which was Stefan Fölster, and it's one of the most quoted uh, papers in this debate. I wish I worked faster. Uh, but, you know, to be honest, uh, at, uh, I mean, so the, the answer to the question, like we said here, was, you know, lifelong learning. And as a researcher and economist, uh, and I, at my union, I have uh, two colleagues at the research department who talk about lifelong learning and practically making that possible. I know we've tried a few times to renegotiate the um, displacement deal, omställning of talent. Uh, so we have a lot of policy here. Uh, what the whole digitalization debate did was it made it a very important topic. So we've talked about it for 30 years. It was a, a nice to have, never really happened anything, but then this debate came. So it wasn't a fun topic because it was just taking the old politics but changing the first, why are we doing this? So we, instead of it's important for our members to stay skill upgraded, we say robots are taking half the jobs. We need this. And then we kept the same. So uh, I wanted to look at other topics. At the same time, I became an expert to the Swedish government's digitalization committee. And what happened at one of the early meetings is there was a big talk about the sharing economy. And there was a lot of scary proposals there from some of my fellow members saying, in order to meet this, we have to liberalize the labor code. We have to do these things that are very, very. Uh, and I'm like, uh, I kind of quickly realized that my job on that committee was to say, you shouldn't make too many proposals on the labor market because that is up to the social partners or the, the negotiating partners to handle that on themselves. So I was like the least fun guy on that <laughs> committee, I think. But re saying this, I went back to, to Unionen and I said, but we don't have any proposals <laughs> here. <laughs> so my job for the next year was to actually uh, convince my union that we need to take this topic seriously and that we have to have politics on this. We have to be solution-oriented. And, of course, when you talked about the sharing economy, which is a term that is going away around the rest of the world, whereas in Sweden, journalists keep on clinging to this word, despite the fact that the two most used examples of the sharing economy aren't sharing platforms. It's Airbnb and, above all, Uber. So, I will talk about Uber because I think Uber is the most significant to labor here, of course. So Uber is, first of all, not a sharing platform. We all, I think, can agree on that. They don't even call themselves, well, they call themselves a ride-sharing app in the US, but it's not ride-sharing. It's a taxi app, to be uh, frank. Uh, it's a platform that has scaled up very, very quickly. The company was founded in 2009, and by the summer, they had facilitated five billion taxi trips around the world. And uh, you might know about the background, but all these taxi trips that are super cheap for some reason, 
uh, well, is to build up data in order to power their uh, self-driving cars for them to drive much smarter around the city. So human taxi drivers accumulate trips around major cities around the world, creating one of the most valuable databases in the world, which can be used to develop artificial intelligence that drives a self-driving vehicle, essentially. So, but Uber scaling up quickly, what they're also doing is they are scaling up and exporting US labor standards. Casualized US labor standards that Uber actually didn't invent. They were around already in the transportation industry in the US. But this essentially is a systematic misclassification of labor. Falsely labeling workers as self-employed or entrepreneurs that are in fact not really negotiating their contracts. They are you know, working on prices set by someone else and uh, a coordinating position, whether it be a digital platform or a switchboard, is telling them how to work and when. But on the other hand, Uber has produced a very, um, in many aspects, an amazing platform that has been inspiring companies all over the world, I should say. So that's another reason to look at it. Peop other companies are looking at Uber when creating their own labor platforms. But it is a, a very advanced platform, and it shows that in some areas of business today, role, the, the traditional role of the employer can be automated and integrated into a digital platform. So you can automate a previously human exclusive zone. So we're talking about robots taking over jobs, like driving cars and stuff. Well, your boss could be an app in the future. And that has been a very significant uh, selling point when talking within my, uh, my union in order to take this seriously. Uh, but as you all know, there has been a lot of disagreement around Uber, to say the least. A lot of, uh, and, and the issue comes down to this, that Uber as a company has had, and probably still does, a culture of breaking rules and disregarding regulation asking for forgiveness rather than permission. And by forgiveness, they are saying change the rules to accommodate us, despite the fact that there are traditional companies competing on a certain regulatory level and they are you know, gaining competitive advantages by cheating, saying we are a digital platform or something entirely different, but they're not. They should be following the same rules. So if Uber, which is in Sweden, and we will have more type of Uber-like business models in Sweden, the issue that we have to handle is how do we regulate them? And that is, I think, the key to the future, successfully regulating platforms. How am I doing for time, by the way? I am getting to the end. So, but what's tricky in Sweden is regulating the labor standards. And like I said in the Digitalization Commission, that is our job. Our job is to get platform companies to sign collective agreements and integrating them into the software. So an automated employer needs to be programmed in a way that it follows the agreement. If we can succeed in doing that, we have gone a, far, like, a long way. And like Carl Petter Tuvalson said earlier, we have a very flexible model, and this is where the flexibility shows. The labor market is mainly regulated by contracts. But from our perspective, we are then co-regulators, or what you should say. So practically trying to do this, what, what we are trying to do is we, we are trying to strike up a dialogue with platforms. Because what we actually have to establish is the companies imitating the Uber model, what they're also imitating is the Silicon Valley version of the platform economy. And that will never work in a Nordic country unless we become an American-style economy. And I think that... Very few politicians think that is a good idea in 2017. 2015, they might have thought so, but things have gone bad pretty quickly. Uh, so, of course, dialogue is working. So one thing we're looking at with, with some companies is saying, you have a sectoral agreement, you could, and some have, signed already. How can we help you to integrate this agreement, central aspects that we find important, and make your platform abide and, and um, what is the word, comply with the rule work we have here more efficiently. So for instance, if we have the temp agency agreement, which I think is perhaps the one that might be used the most in this one because it's usually gig work, it's temporary work, 
For you come out to a workplace, for instance, uh, you have to meet the safety steward. Well, how about you build in a function where you sign uh, with your bank ID saying, yes, I have met the safety steward, the safety steward signs it. I mean, what this presents, if we can successfully integrate our rules into the code, code is as Lawrence Lessig, is that his name, six? He, he said in 1999 that code is law. So regulating this means making the code follow the law. And if we can be a proactive partner in, in integrating our law into their code, we might have solved a big topic or a big problem. Something else I realized work, uh, sitting as an expert for the Digitalization Commission is that digitalizing uh, regulation across the economy at different government agencies and governing bodies, there is no centralized structure in Sweden for handling that within our government apparatus. So in our report, uh, Svenska, uh, platform, the platform economy and the Swedish model, we take actually a broader approach, saying that maybe the social partners should be an active part in the process of digitalizing uh, our existing regulation, essentially. Meaning new standards that are easily integratable into digital platforms of various form should be done in one place. And that place, the social partners have an important role meaning we can develop standards that the market actors think are better, meaning unions and platforms get a seat at the table when new regulatory standards are developed with relevant government agencies. So that, that is our vision for the future. Right now it's, but right now it's about finding out more, finding members, so white-collar workers like we represent on platforms, they're kind of hard to find. We do have a self-employed membership, but if you look at the data on how big this is in Sweden, it's about 2% of the labor force that have worked towards the platform. Very few do it on a regular basis. Uh, there are a few industries where this is impact, like taxi and uh, bike couriers who deliver food. Those are areas where I think the people working there are doing it on a much higher basis. But it is a challenge that a lot of these are extra jobs. We are used to organizing people in full-time positions people used at working in one sector at a time. But we could have a future where it's a white-collar worker who does extra shifts in an area where the transport worker union is active. So, rounding up, this creating regulation and regulating the platform economy is something that a Swedish union can't, one union can't do on their own. I would like to see more cooperation between unions organizing members in the Nordic countries around solving some of the practical aspects of organizing. And I think six, six will get into this a little bit more, uh, which is w one approach where we are developing with IG Metall, because this is not a Swedish problem, it's a global problem, especially for white collar platforms that are international in scale. But we also have a really good dialogue with the Transport Workers Union and the great work they are doing in organizing people in the um, biking careers and on the taxi uh, markets. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. And thank you, Frederick. Now, if, if you're not opposed to it, I would like to give the floor to Six, and then there will be uh, some minutes for questions at the end. So please note your questions so you don't forget them. We will come back to them. And uh, so thank you very much, Frederick. And now we have our international guru from Frankfurt, IG Metals 6 Silberman, who is originally from Silicon Valley, I think. Doesn't it work, your mic? mic? Oh, you can have mine otherwise. And 6 is working for IG Metal on their, uh, in their um, effort or initiative to organize uh, crowd workers and platform workers and to have a dialogue with the platforms <coughs> about the working conditions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I guess I'm stuck very far away from everyone behind two tables in technical infrastructure. So that's life. Uh, how do I make this full screen? Control L is not what I want. Control L, no, that's not what I want either. Uh, what are the what are the Swedish language Scandinavian universe keyboard shortcuts? How do I make it full screen? That? No. That one, it's going to be this one. It's totally going to be this one. No. That. Yes, I'm good. 
but mm. you are a computer scientist. Come on. I know, right? <laughs> This is one thing that I learned, is that uh, a lot of software is internationalized in different ways, and all the keyboard shortcuts are different, and how do we make this full screen? It's a PDF, and I think it's loaded in the browser. Yeah, that's what I tried, too. Yes. <laughs> Maybe it's Control-Shift-F. Uh, no, that was optimistic. Can I try one thing? No, that wasn't it. Well, we'll just do this. That's fine. Yeah. We try all the same things. No, that's fine. I'm going to try one more thing. And then if this doesn't work, we'll just we'll just move on with our lives. Oh, I see. There's no uh there's no Acrobat reader. Okay, that's fine. All right, we'll just. Uh, oh, that's gonna be that's gonna be unfortunate. All right. Oh, that's gonna take forever. We're not gonna do that. We're, we'll be here until. Okay. Uh, this is going to be fine if I can advance the slides one at a time. All right, never use slides, apparently, is the lesson. Mm. Page down. How do I get page down? Page down? Oh, no, seriously? It's going to do it like that? OK. Well, I want to be able to just advance one slide at a time, right? That's what I want to do. Well, this is, um, this is a thing. OK, there's no Acrobat reader. Yeah, maybe we want another. Oh, but this is HDMI. That's not going to work either. OK. How am I going to have? Hmm? It is downloaded. Oh. Oh. We'll, we'll be here. Yeah, it takes two minutes. All right, you try it. <laughs> so, how many of you, who's, who's a trade unionist here? What, what, are, what, are, what are some of the other people? Just shout, shout. Researcher? Politics? Intergovernmental organization? Okay. How many people have spent some amount of time investigating or understanding online labor platforms? Okay. Can you tell me some of the things that you have discovered and learned? Yeah, that's what I was expecting. There was going to be an administrator password. Let's, let's have like for five minutes a little discussion. What, what do you guys know and what are the questions that you have? Some, somebody who raised your hand a minute ago. Trade unionist, researcher, politician. Yeah, Hans. How do we really try to combat? How do we try to regulate it? Is it possible to regulate it? So there were a number of questions. And secondly, the question were like, how, how, should we <coughs> or how should we try or how should we organize uh, people working uh, on the platform economy? And how, how should we go on beyond the boundaries where we have, as Frederick, Frederick said, uh, uh, employers, uh, uh, employees working in one sector, or perhaps have three or four types of jobs mm -hmm. toggling mm -hmm. around the uh, around the uh, 
different sectors. So yeah. that's that's a challenge, uh, really. Let me ask one more question, and then I'll check in on the status of the technology. Okay, we've talked about Uber, we've talked about Airbnb. Are there some other platforms that you have heard of? Could you just shout out names of labor platforms for me? Upwork, Upwork okay. Anyone? Amazon, Amazon what? Amazon, okay. Care.com, Care okay. TaskRabbit, okay. Okay, good. So I have the right presentation for this group. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's going to take too long. I'll just scroll down with the mouse and that's going to be how it'll be. So I work for Iggy Metall in Frankfurt. Who knows what Iggy Metall is? Okay, I don't have to explain. I'm American, you can tell by my accent probably. I moved to Germany two years ago. Before that, I got my PhD in information and computer science in California. Um, and I know that half of you are gonna ask me at the break, you know, how did you decide to move to Germany? Um, so in 2008, my colleague Lily Irani and I built a website called Turkopticon, which is a hard name to spell, and I'll show you a slide at some point about how to spell it. Um, it's used by about 30,000 online workers to review customers on Amazon's labor platform, which is called Mechanical Turk. So I've been on the worker side in online labor markets for about nine years, but I've only been in trade unions for, for two. So I have four points today. The first is there are platforms for every kind of work. There are platforms for every kind of work. And you're, you're thinking, what about lawyers and doctors and high-skilled people? There are platforms for all of those already. Not there will be, they are already. The second point is all work that can be done remotely, all work that can be done remotely will, not very far in the future, take place in a global labor market. Platforms will be a big part of this. It won't be the whole story, but they will be a big part of it. And Germany and Scandinavia will not escape. I don't think it's possible to prevent this, but this is my third point, it is possible to organize these workers and regulate these labor markets. It's not easy, we're just starting, but it is possible. And my fourth point, and this is really the central point here, is that we have to act globally. We cannot think anymore, how are we gonna be competitive as Swedes? How are we gonna be competitive as the Nordics? How is Europe gonna be competitive? Because what that means is that we're creating an incentive for people in the developing world to underbid us. We need to work together with them. Think globally, act locally is a 20th century slogan. We have to act globally. So my first point, there are platforms for every kind of work. One of the oldest crowd work platforms is Amazon's platform, Mechanical Turk. You can find a lot of data processing tasks on it. Um, how are we doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I have screenshots, but whatever. You can go to mturk.com and you can look at the tasks yourself. You can find tasks like transcribe a receipt, enter keywords for a photo, find email addresses for businesses, find a photo of a product. You can find small writing tasks like write a description for a product. So when you go to Amazon or Zalando or any of these online stores and you see these little three or four sentence descriptions of the shoes that you're gonna buy or whatever, who's writing them? Mostly they're not employees anymore. There are people somewhere that have completed a task on a crowdsourcing platform. And you might think, well, these tasks seem very simple. A lot of these should probably be automatable. And I think that I'm really grateful for the speaker before who showed the picture of the, the guy on the scale with Barack Obama stepping on the scale behind him. A lot of these tasks are, are of this sort of nature where they seem very simple. Well, why is that funny? Well, it's obvious to any person with a brain who follows the news and knows who Barack Obama is. It seems very simple to us but what's simple for computers and what's simple for humans are not the same thing. There are other platforms with similar kinds of micro tasks. I'll just name some. Crowdflower is a major American platform. There's a sort of German competitor. It's called Clickworker. Microsoft is one of their clients. You've probably never heard of them, but if you have ever used Bing, Microsoft search engine, probably nobody's used Bing either, but uh, if you've used Bing, yeah, thank you. Woo. Okay, so you can take pictures of this. Uh, take a picture of that one, tweet that. 
Uh, you can tweet that too. Who's tweeting? Okay, you're tweeting. Okay, good. Or, or at least taking pictures. Just tell me when you're ready and I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, Clickworker is sort of the German microtask platform. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's kind of not controversial here, but I like to be positive about things. Uh, and that one, I guess without context, it's kind of, kind of boring. But, um, and then there are also these sort of, oh, this is, this is, my head is the wrong shape. Um, there's sort of managed crowdsourcing platforms like CrowdGuru in Germany. So these are some tasks, we won't talk about them. Um, so these platforms let you write software that automatically posts work and checks the work that you get and decide which workers to pay. You can automate all of this. And you can even decide through software which workers will get work in the future. So this is automated management. Frederick talked about this with Uber. We talk a lot about self-driving cars with Uber, automated drivers. I'm really glad. I think this is the first time that I've ever heard anyone talk about this at a conference. Uber has already automated management. Passengers give a rating, one to five stars, and the drivers with bad ratings get fired automatically. So what's part of Uber's business model? Part of Uber's business model is replacing 20,000 dispatchers working for local taxi companies all over the world with 1,000 programmers working in San Francisco, all working for Uber. Somebody mentioned Upwork. There are also freelance platforms where you can find more higher skilled work, engineers, writers, graphic designers, programmers, virtual assistants, project managers, accountants, lawyers. Upwork is the biggest English speaking platform. I think there are bigger ones in China, but I don't know Chinese, so. There are Swedes on Upwork. I don't know if you can see that from there. I looked for Swedes on Upwork. There's lots of Swedes on Upwork. This one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can interrupt at any time. Yeah, we'll do this. Can you hear it? Yeah, OK. And, and the Swedes on Upwork, you, you can't see this from here, but they're offering, they're offering, I would say, globally competitive rates. They're all basically charging 30 US dollars an hour. I don't, know, I don't know if that's a competitive wage according to your collective agreements, but we can talk about that later. This is a platform that claims that you can hire the top 3% globally of freelance talent. Here you can find fundraising experts, programmers, designers, and somebody to be your interim chief financial officer. There are also platforms that run on a contest basis. This is called 99designs. It's a platform for graphic design. The model is the client describes what they want. Dozens of designers submit designs, receive dozens of designs. Then the client picks the design that they like, and that designer gets paid and everyone else gets nothing. This is Local Motors. They designed a uh, platform. It's a contest-based platform for designing cars. Their crowd designed the first 3D printed electric car. Then Airbus gave them some undisclosed sum of money. Who hasn't heard of Airbus? Yeah, right. You've been, you, you've, you've been in their airplanes. Yeah, they make airplanes. Big European company. Airbus gave them a lot of money. And then they held a contest to design a cargo drone. Right? So if you think, oh no, engineering, we're safe from crowdsourcing. Think again. Software testing. This is a German company called Testbirds. They let um, their clients crowdsource different kinds of software testing, feature testing, usability. All the, It's not just like, oh, are there bugs or are there typos. It's high-skilled software testing. They have a Stockholm office. Computer scientists are also getting funded by national research agencies to study how to automate management of highly skilled tasks like programming, software design, and filmmaking. This is a screenshot of the National Science Foundation website in the United States. They got a million, some researchers got a million and a half dollars. I, I actually knew these people. They were at the same school that I did my PhD at in the same department. And they were figuring out how to break down software engineering into micro tasks. This is a project about flash organizations. It's about automating management of experts. The workers that were recruited to the project through the Upwork platform basically managed themselves. And the software scaffold them to do this. Project also funded by the US National Science Foundation. This is my little job. This is a freelance platform that recruits student workers so people can get used to this model very early in their working lives. They might start while they're a student working on a platform, and they might never work in a normal job with employee rights or benefits or trade union representation or a collective agreement. They might never know what those things are. 
I haven't mentioned any of the platforms for local services yet. Of course, Uber, Deliveroo, Foodora for restaurant delivery, TaskRabbit, and Helpling for house cleaning and household services. By the way, Airbnb has recently become a labor platform. It now has an experiences section where you can buy an experience. This is a very Silicon Valley service, such as surfing instruction or urban cycling or pottery lessons. Uh, or Olala, which is a German platform where you can buy a date. They say it's a paid dating platform. It's a sex work platform. So the point is, platforms are not only for low-skilled work. There's different models for different kinds of work. If it can be done remotely, it can be done over a platform. If it can be done locally, it can be organized over a platform. Swedes and Germans are already doing high-skilled work over platforms. And Swedish and German clients are already outsourcing to platforms to workers both in their countries and elsewhere. If you regulate to prevent this, you create a cost advantage for foreign firms who will still sell to Swedish and German consumers. So I don't think it's possible to prevent through regulation, even if we wanted to. And I'm pleased to hear that nobody here has been suggesting that. I've said that workers can organize. How is that happening? The, the most famous examples are from the local services. Delivery couriers in the United Kingdom went on strike last year. It was a wildcat strike because they're self-employed to pressure management not to cut their base hourly wage to zero and pay them only per delivery. The Independent Workers Union of Great Britain, which is a small unaffiliated trade union of low wage workers, supports them. They do very interesting things like using crowdfunding to raise money because their members can't afford to pay significant membership fees. Delivery couriers have also filed claims with the employment tribunals in the UK, arguing that they are workers, which is the sort of intermediate category, which we already have in the UK. By the way, it's not a good idea. Don't do it. Uh, don't have a third category if you can avoid having one. Uh, in Berlin, the Louvre and Fudor couriers have held demonstrations together and presented unified demands. In Cologne, the Hospitality and Food Service Industry Union, NGG, made a collective agreement with Fudora. I don't have a screenshot for that, unfortunately. I do have a screenshot. Um, from Vienna, Fedora Courier started a works council with the support of the Austrian transport union, Vida. And I know that here in Stockholm, Frederick mentioned this, the Swedish Transport Workers Union has been doing some really good work with Fedora and Uber Eats bicycle couriers. So if you see anybody in a pink jacket or an Uber Eats jacket on the street in Stockholm, please um, stop and ask them if they're a member of a trade union. You're telling me to stop because I Two used minutes, my time. I thought. I gave please. you some extra time. I have four minutes. I know. No. Okay. <laughs> What's happening with Uber? Well, we know what's happening with Uber. Cars are being flipped over and lit on fire. Um, in Seattle, Don Gearhart at the Teamsters organizes thousands of Uber drivers, many of whom are from the Middle East and Africa, over WhatsApp. Literally tens of thousands of them. I think she's the only woman in that room. It's very sad. Um, anyway, there's lots of good pictures from Seattle. Online workers organized through forums. Almost none of them are in unions. Some have informal communities through which they support each other. Mechanical Turk is one of the oldest platforms, and its workers have very well-developed communities that are completely independent from the platform. They create software for each other and teach each other how to use it. This software is extremely sophisticated. I've looked at the code. It's more sophisticated than things that I program. Um, and they even made a set of guidelines, which is kind of like a collective agreement for academic clients, which many of them follow. In Germany, we talk with some of the platforms. In 2015, they published a code of conduct that says that workers uh, should be paid fairly, platforms should only allow serious tasks, the legal context should be clear, and other good things. We had some comments on it. This is our press release. In February, there was a new, ber a new version. And last week, we announced together that we would have Ombudstelle, I've learned from Frederick, means something totally different outside of Sweden, so don't be confused. It's not an ombudsman, it's just a mediation process. I can send you the link to that if you're interested. But it's basically an enforcement mechanism for the code of conduct. This is something that I think we need to talk more about. We see a lot of unaffiliated unions in this space. And so far in Germany and in the UK, there's bad politics between the unaffiliated unions and the big unions. This is a really big problem, and we need to grow up and, and help each other. And I think that we need to have an international competence center on this so that unions and national governments can centralize competence. Um, one problem with organizing these workers is that unions and labor laws are nationally based, but the platforms are global, especially the remote work platforms. So we have unions in Germany and unions in Austria, and we're separately developing competence on the same platforms, and we're duplicating a lot of work. The unions in many countries are sectorally based, 
but a worker on one platform might work on a project for a client in the automotive industry in the morning and work on a project for a bank in the afternoon. And they might not even know who they're working for. They might work on multiple platforms. How should these workers decide which union to be a member of? There's a similar situation with research. There's a lot of research going on, but the researchers are not coordinating with each other. Unfortunately, there's a, very lot, there's a huge amount of extremely superficial media coverage in this space. So I think there's a lot of reasons that it would be nice to have some sort of international competence center that we could all, as trade unions and national governments, support to avoid some of this duplicated effort. I have 30 more seconds. Yeah? OK. Access to the global labor market through these platforms is really good for a lot of people, not just in poor countries, but also in rich countries. People who are discriminated against in the labor market, people who live in rural areas, people who need to care for a child or an older family member and can't leave the house. But even if you go to the poorest countries and you talk to the people who are being successful in online labor markets and you ask them what they like, they might say, oh, I make so much money but I can't turn down any tasks, or I can't complain about anything on the platform because I know the minute that I do, the colleagues in some other country that makes even less money than us will take the jobs. So even the success stories, those workers are already saying that they don't have the bargaining power that they'd like to have in order to have fair working conditions. So the global platforms are not all bad, and they're not all good, but if we leave it to the platforms and to the market, things will probably not go well. If we want workers in global labor platforms to have rights, really have rights, and have bargaining power, we have to act globally. We cannot just think globally and act locally anymore. Personally, I think this means creating new institutions, or at least new initiatives with a global mandate, but maybe you'll have some ideas. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Six, very interesting. I'm sorry about the technical problems. Now I would like to have Six and Frederick together up here because we are here today representatives of Nordic unions, most of us, and we are very proud of the Nordic model where the social partners speak to one another, make agreements. We don't want the EU to interfere in our labor laws or our industrial relations. Uh, we want to keep it this way, at least uh, that's what I read of the context. But the companies are global, the platforms are global, and a Swedish engineer or a technician can easily be replaced by a technician in India if it comes to you know, work that can be sent over the globe digitally. What future do you see for the Nordic model? Is this... Has it come to an end with this? Well, should we let Frederick start? Maybe is my mic is the microphone on? Yeah, okay, now it's on. Uh, well, like some of the previous speakers said in the first interventions, that there's a growing interest internationally for how we handle our labor market. The fact that we self-regulate it and that institutions have been built around supporting that wh where the partners work out the rules of play themselves. Um, and looking at an, the prospect of an international labor market, well, which governing body should step in in case we fail? There is no such governing body today. I'm sorry if the ILO doesn't think that, but uh, <laughs> uh, there's nothing to enforce it. Uh, but what we see with, with globally scaling platforms, um, if we could tap into that type of thinking and start thinking globally around organizing and bargaining collectively internationally, maybe we have a future of a Swedish model that's actually scalable. Um, that's a very theoretical answer, and it maybe it's not realistic, but what's the option? I, I can see that, but, but a global framework, I, I mean, for instance, the cost of living in Sweden is much higher than living in Bangladesh, so most probably an engineer from Bangladesh would demand less pay than a Swedish one. Well, that's the same problem we've had for 60 years. 
yes. low skilled jobs move mm. to low cost countries mm -hmm. and we've managed to keep up anyways because the high skilled jobs are here because we have a system in place that makes sure that when our members are laid off they can be reskilled and move on to more productive sectors in the economy but that's also one of the problems when you say our members because we all also have this problem with reaching out to the people and, and one of my questions to six would be uh, you have been in charge of this IG Metal initiative, faircrowdwork.org, which aims to organizing people on platforms. And I would like to hear, is it a success? Will it be, <laughs> will it be a success? How do you look upon the, the possibilities, really? I mean, uh, uh, of course, we must try. But uh, what's your experience? So, <coughs> I'll talk about our work generally, not FairCrowdwork.org is a website. Mm. It's not an initiative, it's a website. Our initiative is that we have dialogue with the platforms and workers, and the website is a place where we put some words and pictures. We don't reach out to the workers through the website. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That was never gonna work. That was an idea that some of my bosses had before I got there, and they said, no, the website is a place where we can talk to journalists, policymakers, and other trade unionists. Workers do not go out of their way to go to a website that they've never heard of that's operated by an organization that they don't think has any relevance for them. If you ask anyone in Germany outside the trade union sector, what is IG Metal, they'll say, oh, red flags on the street, Volkswagen, if this kind of stuff. They don't, it has nothing to do with me as a crowd worker or as a high-skilled digital person until you talk to them and say, oh, well, you know, I actually half of the tasks that you're doing are being crowdsourced by companies in our sector. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that. It was like, yeah, well, because they protect their identity. Um, so let's just be clear about that. The website is not a solution. Um, it's absolutely possible to reach out to crowd workers. There's, you know, 10 different ways that you can reach out to crowd workers, and this is knowledge that we're trying to move uh, out into other trade unions. Uh, getting in touch with them is not a problem. Mm -hmm. The mandate is the problem, mm -hmm. because as somebody working in a crowdsourcing project at IG Metal, it is my job not to piss off the colleagues in the other trade unions, who think, well, this is Germany, we organize trade unions like this. But I, I go to them, well, this worker's working for Volkswagen in the morning through an intermediary, and for Deutsche Bank in the afternoon through an intermediary. What are we gonna do? We don't have an answer to this yet, and the DGB doesn't have an answer to it either. Um, and I, I've sort of said this already, um, which is that really the problem is they're working for Volkswagen in the morning, and they're working for some American bank in the afternoon. Well, now we have a real problem uh, because I'm a German trade unionist and I'm, my entire organizational and legal basis is rooted in the national labor law system. Um, to come back to the question of the Nordic model, the Nordic model works because unions have power here. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true to a lesser extent in Germany. So I think we can't be naive and think that we're gonna export the Nordic model to America or other developing countries. But how can we then but have I mean a global framework? Yeah, but I mean what I say with the Nordic model is that you solve things through collective bargaining. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that, that is what I mean by the Nordic model. Uh, and then if there are institutions set up to do that or not, I mean right now the institutions are working against the platform workers to a high degree. Mm -hmm. One advantage that many platforms get from misclassifying their, uh, their member base is in a lot of countries they are not allowed to organize. They are forming cartels that are set up to break up an oil company in the United States. Everyone has the same, I mean, competition law is basically the same all over the world, and it's designed to protect consumers against oil companies, not against unions, <laughs> people who are earning below minimum wage, trying to make a decent living and coll bargain collectively. So we have, we have a clash of institutions here, and just like you explained, our m unions are set up to organize workers in an industrial society. We are moving to a post-industrial society, we're already in it, my union is a merger between the service and industry sector, so we don't have that sectoral problem that many do. We organize white-collar workers, which is, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you shower, I mean, jokingly we say, do you shower before or after work? It's, <laughs> it's, it's I mean, but, but it's there and we have all this, we have this inheritance. We have to be respectful of that, but we also have to think that we need to think bigger. Uh, and I think thinking together and doing, I mean, we are and I'm not and just uh, LO people from Sweden. We, are, we don't want to organize blue collar workers, but we need to help each other out here because we could and we already have situations where people are working across uh, our designated areas of organizing. 
And this we can solve practically because we have a flexible model to do this. Please, questions from the audience? Do you have any? Yes? Uh, yeah, uh, if, if that's a problem, if someone working on a platform is under an agreement where you don't have a minimum wage and that becomes a problem, you just add it to the next negotiating round. That's the thing. If you, I mean, we, we have that, we have on many agreements we don't have a minimum wage, but that's probably because we realize that this particular sector, it, we don't require it because it's high skilled people are able to get a good entry wage anyways. But I think for us, the, 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 a lot of the platforms we see today that are employer platforms in that sense, perhaps the temp agency agreement is most relevant. And there we have a minimum. We have several minimum levels. It all depends on what kind of, if you're a student or a pensioner or a regular or, yeah. Uh, but Frederick, do you think that you could get Upwork to sign a collective agreement that says we're going to pay minimum wage or we're going to pay any minimum wage to all of our Swedish workers? Well, then first of all, what you have to work out is Upwork an employer or not, or is it a freelance platform? Uh, say, okay, I am not going to say that Upwork is a freelance platform, but say hypothetically it is. Perhaps it, we need a different, because I mean, I'm, I'm quite sure people working on Upwork have problems with that platform. We need a dialogue on how to constructively improve that platform and make it better for people who work there. So it could be in freelance platforms where we don't have, when we have one freelance agreement in Sweden, I think the journalists have one. Um, and they have a very hard time enforcing the minimum levels there. So there are good examples to look at, uh, but we need to think fresh there, I'd say. But what would be the benefits for the platforms to, to have a follow a code of conduct or a collective bargaining if it's going to cost them more? So part of the answer is marketing. Um, and part of the answer in the German context we've realized is that clients... Um, so the German situation is different from the American situation. The American situation, the tech companies and the platforms are the name brands and they have the power. In Germany, the clients are the name brands, and they have the power. So we can go and talk to the platforms and say, y you, you guys are kind of little. Uh, and actually, you're negotiating with Deutsche Post, who's your client, and is giving you price pressure. And is saying, well, if you don't give us a good price, then we're going to go to some other platform. But it turns out that like the trade unions are sitting on the executive boards of all these big clients. So that's one answer in the European context. Um, what's the incentive for? a big platform like Amazon, at some point you have to, that's when the regulator has to step in, right? Because there's, there's nothing you can do to make Jeff Bezos want to be socially responsible. He doesn't want to be, you need to use the law. Or you get the workers to strike. But there are so many workers. Yeah. It's a communication problem. That's what these mm -hmm. devices are for, right? Mm -hmm. um, to come back to the question from the Swedish colleague, about African workers, for example. Um, yeah, they can make tons of money. They make huge amounts of money, even compared to um, highly skilled jobs that they can find in their local labor markets. Um, time flexibility is totally oversold. They do not have time flexibility. Uh, they need to be awake when the employers are awake. So if you talk to colleagues working on the platforms in India or Bangladesh or Indonesia, they're working nights. 
uh, and they might be working nights on the platforms in addition to a main job where they're sitting in an office during the day or doing something else. Um, so yeah, absolutely. They're making huge amounts of money. Any other question? Then just a, a last remark. In 20 years, what is the Nordic labor model? I think the, the dream scenario. I don't want any glue, you know? No, I want so a bright picture. <laughs> yeah, <Huh>? not dead. <coughs> <laughs> okay. Still kicking? Whenever something happens, people are like, the Swedish model is dying. It's like, yeah. No. I wish someone just did like a news article research on that and see like how many times has been it it's been, been declared dead. dead. No, it's a re resilient model, but it's up to us here and now to start thinking about what do we want it to look like in 20 years. I've always looked upon the Swedish model also like a kind of unique selling point where the social welfare, the unions, the possibility to influence at the workplace makes people want to be creative and innovative and uh, makes us collaborate and share information and, and do great work. But somewhere I don't want to say that Nordics are smarter than everybody else and doing better jobs. Well, yeah, do, do we have some unique selling point in, in Scandinavia or don't we? Yeah, you're fortunate beneficiaries of accidents of history. Yes. Oh, and exploiting colonies. Mm. It's like everyone else in Europe and North America. Mm. I will say one thing in response to your uh, previous question, though. What is, the, what is the future of the Nordic model? As somebody outside of the Nordics uh, in all of my incarnations, um, I think there's two answers to that. One is, yes, that we need to develop social dialogue at a global level. Whether that looks like collective bargaining or not, well, I don't think so, because there's not going to be an international or, or global framework that's going to legitimize actors to create global collective agreements, except for the sort of IFA stuff, which, whatever. I don't, I don't have high hopes for it. Um, but I do think that we're going to, I think we're going to develop we're going to develop social dialogue at a global level with some of these platforms, and some of them are going to have to be forced using legal strategies to come to the table, and we'll find ways to do that. Um, and I think the, the longer view, and you said 20 years, this might be a little bit longer than that, but I think it's the right time frame, which is that I do think that we need to start to develop concepts and conversation literally sentences and words that are not competitiveness, innovation, new technology, increased productivity. I come from America, we've worshiped those things for decades and you have all seen how well that goes. Right? I mean, so many European trade unionists and policymakers have gone to Silicon Valley to make study trips and they're like, oh yeah, we have to do it like this. I'm like, how many homeless people did you step over in the mission? That's what you want? Not really. Right. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting discussion. And now there, is, there will be lunch on the balcony, and we will get started again at a quarter, quarter past one. And please be on time, because we have panelists this afternoon who need to get going after their appearance. So we need to be quite punctual. A quarter past one. Thank you very much. <laughs>